finish uh, Alicia's report on Monday because I'm going to just kind of try to get through what I was talking about. Then we'll let Alicia come back and finish up her discussion. <clears throat> but yesterday I was giving you the four themes that should be associated in your mind and in your notes with 19th century liberal and by liberalism, I mean liberal theology. I'm talking about Christian theology here, although the terms could be applied more broadly. We talked about naturalism, which is the anti-supernatural aspects of 19th century liberalism. And we tried to explain that in terms of Hegel. And I hope you've all got that. I don't want to run back through it again, so I hope it's kind of fairly clear in your head. Immanentism, the sense of which God is understood as being close to us almost indistinguishable from us so that there is a tendency to celebrate the God in us, the God within, you might say, rather than a worship of a distant God who's majestic and holy and separate and transcendent and so on. We tend to get very preoccupied with the sense of which God is in what we're doing. God is part of us and that leads us to humanism in which 19th century theology tended to emphasize the fundamental virtue of our humanity. Man is good. You don't hear so much in 19th century liberalism about sinfulness, depravity, lostness. The old phrase, I don't know if you ever heard this, that tended to capture the spirit of 19th century theology God's not, or here it goes like this. Yeah. God's not so mad, man's not so bad. You ever heard that? No, it does have a nice ring, doesn't it? <clears throat> man's not so bad, man's not so bad. You see, traditional Lutheran, Calvinistic, Catholic theology, it all said man is so bad. He's corrupted. He's shaking his fist in the face of God. He's a fugitive. He's lost. He's guilty. 19th century theology minimizes all of those themes so that man starts looking very virtuous because God is so close to us and there begins to be a celebration of what we can accomplish. Human achievement, human progress all become thematic, you see, 19th century liberalism. To this day, although it's been modified substantially. So we're going to say uh, math is basically good. And this becomes, by extension, a, a great affirmation of human accomplishment. When we do these great things, we are, in a sense, an expression of God's work among us. So they can side with Arminianism? Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. To the degree that term would even apply, they would be much more Arminian. But I wouldn't even use that term because that's an insult to Arminius. Arminius took human sinfulness way more seriously than 19th century liberals. I would call it more Pelagian. Pelagius was the guy who said, you know, we're basically wonderful you know, people with virtue, you know, you know what I'm saying, that, that, so even Arminius would be a, at the level of sort of um, affirmation of virtue that you find in these, in this album. 19th century uh, liberalism was optimistic. Things are getting better. And they are getting better through human achievement. There is progress. This is a Hegelian idea of progress, however. Now, this is a subtle point for those who have ears to hear. All right? I won't test you on this, but some of you are tuned into these issues enough to appreciate this little footnote. So this is fine print at the bottom of the page that I'm giving for those who are interested. Puritanism was optimistic. The Puritan theology coming out of Calvin was optimistic in a post-millennial sense. Things are getting better because God is building his kingdom in history 
through the proclamation of the gospel. So post-millennial eschatology, which was virtually universally the Puritan outlook, was part of the inspiration behind the whole New England, this city on a hill, all of those paradigms really reflect that sort of optimistic outlook, was part of the Puritan view. Puritanism, however, through especially, you know, in Europe and in America, became gradually secularized so that by the time you get to the 19th century, you still have this optimistic outlook, but it's been stripped of its Puritan theology, radical corruption, God sovereignly working in history, and has become this kind of humanistic, almost pantheistic view of God simply working through human industry. So the optimism stays put, but the theological and philosophical rationale for the optimism changes drastically from Puritanism to 19th century liberalism. This is part of the reason that at the beginning of the 20th century, a revival of conservatism also brought back into focus a rather negative view of human history. Things are getting worse. In order to be a true Christian, you had to believe things are going down. We're going to hell in a handbasket. It's going down, not up. Because it was seen this optimism became associated with liberalism. And so conservatives said, you know, throw all of it out and took a kind of dispensational, premillennial approach that viewed things as getting worse and worse. End of footnote. Back to lecture. Okay? Uh, so anyway, <clears throat> 19th century philosophy tended to have these features, optimism, humanism, immanentism, naturalism. It was catastrophic to that all of that sort of optimistic outlook when the First World War took place. Because there was this widespread belief that things are getting better and that we are moving toward the dawning of a new day and human achievement is going to create this wonderful kind of emerging, almost utopian situation in the world and then we get World War I, where we just blow each other into kingdom come. Nine million men in arms, let alone the civilians, wiped out. Europe is devastated in World War I. So much so that World War I got the nickname what? It was called the what? Anybody know? Anybody? It's what, yeah? It was named the Great War. The Great War. The Great War. And the other nickname it had at the time, which almost became a joke later, but at the time it was what? The war to end all the wars. The war to end all wars. See what that implies? We finally got it out of our systems. We're finally done with this nonsense of shooting at each other. Because we're finally now arriving at truly this wonderful new age. The one guy who really saw the ugliness of all of this was Karl Barth. And I'm not a great cheerleader for Karl Barth, but I want to give credit where credit is due. Karl Barth recognized that 19th century liberalism, taken to its logical conclusion, produces Nazism. And that was his great argument. That's what he was saying. During the First World War, he saw it coming because he saw in 19th century Germany this almost unbelievable confidence in human achievement. And he thought, in the German people especially, the German nation, the German psyche, was that we are the place where all of this is going to be realized. We are where this great kingdom of God on earth is going to be fully realized. And, and, and Bart saw it. You put enough confidence in human virtue and you get a Nazi every day of the week. You see, it's only when we really appreciate how deeply corrupt we are that we have an appropriate guard against becoming Nazis. Please see this. Because we have the same things going on in our culture, we just call them by different names. The same forces are at work. 
The more you start telling people how good they are, the more likely you are to produce a monster. It's only a sense of human corruption that guards us against that. And so for that, I love Karl Barth. I mean, I think Karl Barth overstated the case, and that's why, you know, we have some problems with him theologically. But in terms of recognizing the train that he was on, he was trained as a liberal. He was trained under Schleiermacher. He was trained under these guys. He saw it. He saw it in Germany. And he started raising his protest. And the more Nazism rose, the more Bart protested until finally he got kicked out of the country. All right, so kind of see that. All right, so let's go back and, and pick up. These are the themes of uh, 19th century liberalism. And if we think about You think about the effect that this had on biblical studies. It's uh, a separate little kind of thought here I want to throw in. Biblical scholarship, that is the way in which we study the Bible, changed profoundly under the influence of 19th century liberalism. It gave birth to an entirely different paradigm for studying the Bible from what had been common um, you know, in earlier times. It gave rise to, first of all, what is called broadly higher criticism, but here I'm going to use more of the term historical criticism. And I, I, I hope you'll get this, especially you who think you may be doing further studies in, you know, theology, biblical studies, and so on at the college level or even post-college level, that you will be, you, yeah, you'll get this in infinitely greater, um, you know, detail that I'm giving you as you write. I just want you to kind of see it coming. I want you to have some idea of where this came from and how the game is played. All right. What do we have? We have a Bible, and the Bible purports to tell us about stuff like miracles. You know, Jesus walks on the water. Jesus rises from the dead. Now, I gave you earlier sort of the more or less kind of simplistic ways liberalism would be liberal to deal with that. You know, well, it was the paper bag theory, or Jesus fainted on the cross, that kind of thing. Historical criticism is vastly more uh, sophisticated than that. This is not simply trying to give naturalistic explanations. The, the task of historical criticism, higher criticism generally, source criticism is the term you'll also run into here. It's an attempt, in a sense, to get behind the biblical documents as we find them and ask how did this document come to be produced given that we know that miracles don't happen, and given that we know that basically we live in a universe that is naturalistic and immanentistic and humanistic and so on, given what we know based on these assumptions that flow out of liberal theology, how do we account for this Bible we've got, which is so full of stuff that seems to contradict our liberal understanding, right? That's a bit of a problem, isn't it? When the book that we cherish the most is full of all kinds of things that seem to contradict those principles that we hold most dear, then we got to fix the problem. And so how do we do it? Well, we say that those documents were not produced based on actual observations of historical events, but they were produced based on the way that communities tried to express their faith. And so you begin to get a notion of an accumulating kind of tradition reflected in various communities of faith in which the life of Christ begins to be embellished. Embellished because we want to, we want to honor him. And so how best to honor our memory of Jesus than to begin adding to his life these sort of supernatural qualities. He was virgin born. 
well, that we know he wasn't virgin born, but it does seem to sort of honor his memory. And so historical criticism became a way of trying at a very sophisticated level to find the strands, the sources, the historical circumstances, the communities, and so on that were at work behind the scenes to eventually produce, at a much later date usually, the documents of the New Testament as we have received them. <clears throat> and this gave rise to something that was commonly called the old quest of the historical Jesus. May I speak to Zero Leader for just a second? Yes. <laughs> zero. <laughs> it's the 100th day of school, so. Is it really? Today's the 100th day. Amazing. <laughs> Has anybody ever heard of the old quest of the historical Jesus? Are you really zero? Are you going to be Oh, you're perfect for the job. <laughs> Fabulous. The most doubtful <laughs> zero the hero I ever uh, encountered in all years. He enjoyed that job way too much. <laughs> Who was, when you guys were, you, when you, do you remember that far back? What, kindergarten? Who was here in kindergarten? A few of you. Who was it? Who was zero the hero that year? I don't think I was even here then. You guys were at Knox, right? I think we didn't have it. That was a later. That was a later innovation. All right. So the old quest of the historical Jesus, and then again, if you is, is this a phrase? Anybody ever heard that phrase? The quest of the historical Jesus is that brand new to everybody in the room? All right. Well, it will not be new again if you do any further studies. This. This idea of the quest of the historical Jesus has been around since the 19th century. There, this is now called the old quest because in the 20th century we developed the new quest of the historical Jesus. And N.T. Wright, who's an English theologian, has now given us the third quest of the historical Jesus. So this has been an ongoing story. The quest of the historical Jesus has been around, you know, and it's a pretty well-known theme. So the first time you hear it in your further studies, you're going to say to yourself, oh, Mr. Gore told us about that. Thank you, Mr. Gore me an email and say, you're not as bad as I used to think, that kind of thing. You know? <laughs> um, so anyway, the, the whole point of this is to uncover the true original Jesus. Not the Jesus we find in the Bible, who is clearly transformed into this legendary character that nobody can take seriously as a matter of historical fact. But what was the original Jesus actually like? We, uh, we grant there was a guy who lived in Palestine in the first century, and he had some remarkable aspects to it. And assuming, as we must, that he didn't do the things that are attributed to him in the Bible, what was he actually about? And that generally is called the quest of the historical Jesus. I don't know why it's called the quest of it's always struck me as a little strange, that's the phrase that's used. It's a an attempt to reconstruct the true historical Jesus. Ever heard of the Jesus Seminar? Ever heard of that? They meet every four years or so. And they, as a practice, will take some text of the Bible. And they will analyze the text. And the basic question they treat is, did Jesus really say that? So, for example, the Beatitudes. I don't know that this is one they've done, but I assume it is. They'll take the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the more, and so on. Yeah. And they'll ask the question, did Jesus really say that? And they do a lot of study, and they write papers, and they go through all kinds of scholarly attempts to figure out if what we have in the Bible purporting to be the words of Jesus are actually the words of Jesus. And usually they'll take a vote, you know, and the voting is an interesting thing. They have a black marble, a white marble, and a gray marble. This is true. These, these are first-rate scholars, by the way. These are guys that are widely regarded worldwide as the finest <coughs> New Testament scholars out there. 
And they'll study a text, and then they'll all vote secretly. They'll throw their marble in. Black marble, Jesus never said that. White marble, Jesus did say that. Gray marble, not so sure. Maybe so, maybe not. You know, 50-50. And then they publish a paper, and it usually gets run in the, in the newspaper. You know, it gets some press, and they'll publish some kind of document indicating, well, based on our scholarly examination, we don't think it's very likely that Jesus said the Beatitudes, for example. You know, something like that. That is still an ongoing expression of the quest of the historical Jesus, trying to reconstruct the original Jesus based on this rather legendary stuff we have in the Bible. That all started in the 19th century, and it all started as a natural product of these assumptions. What, what is that called again? The Jesus Council? The Jesus Seminar. Jesus Seminar. Yeah. The Jesus Seminar. Your folks, uh, I bet, I bet every, all of your parents, if you went home and said, you ever heard of the Jesus Seminar, they would all say yes, and then none of them are like it. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, that's good. <clears throat> but that would be a good expression of ongoing liberal influence in the Christian church, doing this kind of, his, you know, this is called higher criticism. Criticizing the Bible, not in terms of its content or the textual, you know, nature of the language, so on, but trying to get behind the documents to what are purported to be the sources upon which these documents were produced. Just saying. I think you might have just answered it, but so how do they even determine whether or not Christ would have said something? Do they just go back to the original manuscripts or sources? It is not so much going back to the original manuscripts, though they do do that. But it's rather a matter of evaluating the actual content of what's said and hypothesizing how those statements might have come into the scriptures. It proceeds on highly speculative you know, terms. But let me, this for, I've got a friend who's a PhD in, in uh, biblical studies in Eastern. I taught him Greek 100 years ago. Now he's become, honestly, he's become much more of a you know, Greek scholar than I am or probably ever will. But he's published quite a few books and so on. He is completely committed to this particular book. He loves the Jesus Seminar. He listens to my lectures online. And he feels perfectly free to criticize me every time I violate the rules, which I frequently do. And he'll send me long emails pointing out what an idiot I am because I am so oblivious to the findings of higher critical research into the scriptures. And I still am living way back in the 17th century, basically, committed to the idea that the Bible is giving us a fair and accurate purport, you know, uh, presentation of the life of Christ. And what kind of dinosaur are you to believe that? Come on, man. Get with it. You know, it's, now he's nicer than that. But that's, this, that's kind of, because I, I don't buy this. I think that, you know, I just want you to understand it. I want you to have some idea of uh, what's going on there. All right, I'm still not quite done with 19th century liberalism, but unfortunately the clock has run me out of town, so Monday we'll hear the rest of uh, Alicia's report and I'll finish up these comments and we'll move on from there.